Okay, well, prepare yourself, guys. This is T3 Media Studios. We are talking through the medias. We are going to give you our great episode on the fifth element, the costume design. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm sorry I stumbled over the... We had John, we Paul, John Paul Gautier and his amazing concepts for the fifth element and what he brought costume design-wise. Yes. Really changed pop culture and costume design in my mind for this movie, so it's going to be a great conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, don't forget, we are also a YouTube channel. We are a podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe at T3 Media Studios as uh, we are going to be giving away prizes to all the coolest people here. <laughs> <laughs> who are participating on, on, during the show. So we'll give you the instructions of all that a little bit later, but let's get right into the show because, you know, Heck it's yeah. my fault that we started a little bit late. It always your fault. We, this is the theme of our show is we are never on time. It always ends with an ish. So if we say eight, it's an ish. If we say seven, it's an ish. So we got there, though, today. I kind of made him start not his normal 15 minutes late. Yeah. So he lives by his stereotypes and, sometimes. And it's always supposed to be a tight 30, and it never, never is. is a tight 30. Oh. Never a we tight live 30. by a tight 30, never a tight 30. <laughs> okay, well, um, this is supposed to be about the fifth element, not about how awesome I am. Okay, let's get every, it. Every episode's about how awesome you are, is it not? Because you like to take that, that I'll take theme, huh? I'll yeah. Take so back to our topic. If you are interested, obviously, in cosplay and costumes, please come join us for this one. This is going to be an amazing conversation regarding how the fifth element really changed the name of the game for an action fantasy sci-fi movie, really took it from the doom and gloom, gave it some color, gave it some uh, vibrancy, and really nailed it in that department. It was creative. You had Couture in a movie, and if there's anything Couture should be in, it is definitely a fantasy movie. Yeah. Definitely fits. Couture, Couture should always be in fantasy movies. So to start us off, um, a few things that I think um, we should really get into are some basics of the movie. This movie um, was originally supposed to be a trilogy. I didn't, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah, he took three scripts, put them into one. It was amazing. Luke Be uh, Besson really like wanted to kind of not make it a drawn out scenario. I will say for back in the day, they did complain about how it felt like it may have had some holes, but we all know that the cult classic as it is, The Fifth Element, the people who love it, love it hard. So, yeah, ultimately, yeah. it was, the, it was, it was probably the right, right decision, choice for the time. But if this movie were made today... Oh my gosh. Well, I'm surprised in this age of well, reboots, not reboots we're not we haven't attempting decided to, do it. to I think that reboot it, was, it. It might be that there's too many people afraid to do it. You know, yeah. like there's there's certain movies that because they're such a cult classic, they don't touch it wasn't, anymore. It wasn't, this wasn't well received at its time. At its time, but it was an underground yeah. cult classic. Like it's, it's, did, did it's Chris Tucker like, get a uh, lazy? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he did, or something like that. Unbelievable! Yeah. I and he wasn't even the original actor for that role. It was Prince. It was, uh, they, yeah. they had Prince in mind for and the role. Yeah. to bring that about, so Prince and uh, Jean-Paul actually had a conversation whenever he was in the talks for the movie. Right. And they were going over costume ideas, which I always found this interesting. And Prince stated that the ideas that Jean-Paul had for uh, Ruby Rod was too effeminate and for Prince. And they had, he had originally had him in gowns and had originally had him more in the uh, feminine side of his costumes versus right. where like they a did the fishnet blend. type of like, I think like it was like, it was intense ball gowny. Yeah. And so when Chris Tucker came in, they really played to his masculinity within the femininity and really did that gender bending. One of the great points about this movie with, in regards to its costume design, is how they brought about the LGBTQ aspect. Creating gender bending costumes. You just to just to continue on the Ruby Rod aspect with Chris Tucker, the top of his outfit being very ball gown ish yeah, with the sleeves. Open. Yes. Then it, they turn it into a pantsuit and creating it that masculinity with the effeminate uh, characteristics that were applied to his character right, that he right. brought to it. And they did it more than once because yes. the leopard was yes. open. Yes. Yes. And the rose the is rose also. The big. Yeah, so they really brought the ball gown to the top half and brought that masculinity to the bottom half, give yes. him some pants. So it was really nice that way. I think that he, you know, John Paul really made that gender bending aspect to it uh, mainstream at the time, which for that time was not seen. Right. You did not have that in your main movie. It wasn't aspects. a lot of that, in the, yeah. especially in the 90s. It wasn't a lot of that going yes. on uh, then. Yeah. But you see, Chris Tucker did, did at least pull a little inspiration from Prince because, you know, oh, the, yes. the theory of Prince is 
Yes. He may be on the effeminate side, but he can pull any lady he wants. I know. And that was, I think, the genius of his and character, And Chris Tucker too. was yes. like, well, we're going to do that. We're going to continue that role. In, a, in, a fem, in an effeminate outfit, but I got the He's going to be a ladies man. <laughs> well, you know, when you think about what the movie time frame is set in, it's like 2,260-something. What is it? 2 2 63. The year that the movie took place? Yeah, but the movie took they place. I always get it wrong. It was, it was probably 2025. It's, you know, 2263. <laughs> We're supposed to have the flying cars now. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, don't get me started with Back to the Future. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with that time frame, you know, the idea of what was considered normal masculine feminine behavior and his real draw to bring that as normalcy. Like, it was normal that Ruby Rod was dressed in a feminine manner and acted with effeminate qualities but was pulling the ladies left and right. Like, right. had the right. fan club, had all these people fawning over him and really melding that personality and those characteristics. It was which definitely larger than life. Definitely larger than life. And the costume design really brought about creating those scenarios for him. I really loved how John Paul did that. He, he created literally 10 collections in one movie, y'all. There was this was a ninety million dollar budget, the, the largest budget for something not done in Hollywood. Something that that was done in a, a, a it's considered a foreign film. I, yes, I thought yes. this movie was uh, an American a no. film. It is considered a foreign. It's film. considered yeah. a foreign film, yeah. and it was one of the largest budgets of the time mm -hmm. for a, a foreign film. Foreign yeah. film, and getting to to combine that that couture with Jean Paul, and he made a thousand thousand. Do you know that every uh, extra in there was in couture. Oh. The freaking aliens are couture. He designed. There are there are his drawings for every character that is displayed in there. Every character. It just it baffles my mind. Can you imagine the kind of work that took? It was it was a huge. It project. was huge. So to break down, let's start with a couple of the characters. We got your main characters. You got Lilu. We all love us some Lilu. I myself cosplay as Lilu. That's genuine. That's how we met. I was literally about to start. That that's is how, how this whole thing started. This whole thing started. Talking through the media started here in Comic-Palooza. many years ago now. When when uh, Tabitha was just fangirling. I, I was, because I was in my Lilu and my bandages running up to you. Runs up to you. <laughs> I was like, I'm oh all, my all, God. Su all supreme being and everything. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and then we've been friends ever since. And friends ever since. And well, then, frenemies. Yeah, yeah. It's a love-hate relationship, <laughs> if we're going to be honest about it. I mean, very brothers-like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we started out, it's a very much stepbrothers movie. That's us. Yeah. Started out hating each other, fought a lot, ended up with some love-hate. So Threat, threatens to punch me in the face when I uh, sleep. He's got a punchable face, y'all. Punchable okay? face. It's a punch, it's, you see it, it's a punchable face. Jeremy so, knows about yes. my, my, my punchable <laughs> face. Yeah. <laughs> It's always lovely to get to come back here and kind of relive these sort of like iconic things that we love that yeah. brought other people together. It's a real kind of testament to what Comic Palooza is as well. Just yeah. bringing people together, loving the, sh the shit that we love, all that good stuff. So, with that said, let's get to Lilu. Lilu. Yes. Lilu's costume. Let's start with our first one. Do y'all know how the bandages came about? I assume like someone was giving. injured. No, well, <laughs> like so. Giving. Being birthed. She was okay, so it's her birth scene. So they were like, okay, how can we do this birth scene? But you can't be naked. So they're trying to figure this out. So you got Mila's over there, and she's like thinking about like the hospital gown. She's like, you know, we gotta associate how you wear the hospital gowns, what that is. And so when they're talking, she's like, what about bandages? Could we do anything with bandages? Right. And then John Paul just like took it and ran. It was like and, a very sexy mummy issue. Yeah, like, yeah. well, it was the bandages that, like, they, for their technology in that time, was, like, what shocked her to life after right. the DNA splicing thing that she was in. And so she wore the bandages as the birthing scene aspect to her, and it was just to kind of show a way for her to be born as the supreme being and a human while still having some modesty. She always had some, she had some really good interviews where she's talked about how doing the stunts in that costume was not pleasant. Mm -hmm. There was so much. She There's had not much too. Yeah, she had. She could not wear pads. She could not have anything protecting her skin. So she's doing all these stunts, and she's getting beat to hell. Like she bruised, scraped everything. She said a lot of the things you see where she's destroyed on screen, she actually had. Right. They didn't have to give her so much makeup to bruise her up and to scrape her up because she was doing the stunts and getting practical them naturally. Practical effects. <laughs> yes, it was practical effects. 
so I always thought that those sorts of things to the how they took advantage of what was happening in the making of the movie really kind of gives it that authenticity to what's going on, which not, I loved. Also, not the we've talked about this before on previous episodes. Not the original, or, or not the person that could have played Lilu. Yeah, it could have been uh, one of my favorite actors. Yeah. Up, I know we're supposed to keep it PG, but Showgirls. I know. Don't uh, get me wrong about Showgirls. That's a whole. You gotta watch our show to know about that show, <laughs> or that movie, I should say. That's a pivotal movie for me. It started a lot awakening. of my life. It that, was an awakening movie. Yeah, but yeah. That that could have been one of uh, our Lilu in an alternate universe. It alternate universe. Uh, Say by the bell. Well, Jesse. Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. What's uh, her name? I genuinely am drawing a blank on her name. But ultimately, I feel like. Uh, Mila was. She, Mila was a great. I think she, she was. Is, the, she was the chosen. Looking back on it, it's hard. You know, you just, you make these comments about how you what actor could fill this role and how would that movie have been different. I don't know if I want to even imagine a different actor yeah. for Mila's role for Lilu because she just really. It was the right role for a model transitioning into acting. Right. To take there was very little talking. You had to act with your body, which is what models do. And, and speaking and, of, and her being a model probably helped. Really with, generated with, with, a lot of love in that and, aspect. And, and she did a very good job modeling those clothes. Exactly. And that, acted her, uh, uh, her butt off. She acted <laughs> her butt off. I know, we have a very not PG show, so I'm having to make, watch my sailor yeah. mouth. <laughs> but, we, but she she did a, a phenomenal job and looks great while doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. She really pulled off, I think, what would be... And granted, it's an unrealistic aesthetic to aspire to yeah. the idea of Mila and her body, and we get that, but she's a model. It was that time it, frame. It's yeah. that time frame. It's for the time of the 90s, that's what they did. That's what, what they the presented. Were. The models were skinny, and the models had really no curves, and they were very small-chested, small booties, like, didn't extend the knowledge of what women were across the board. But I think it worked out really well for the time, and we can't judge a movie from the past necessarily by the current times, right. which is always what you say. What was your favorite uh, legal costume? Well, my favorite is the bandage. The bandage? I'm also gay. That makes sense. I think my favorite is the... <laughs> I think my favorite is the, is the, the one from the, uh, the opera. Ultimately, I, I felt like the. You're talking about the white, because that the white scene, top, the suspenders. She, yeah, the, the scene when she took out all the uh, yeah. the main. Well, the that's her fighting outfit. Yeah. You can't fight in bandages. You crazy? You saw her. She was yeah. falling through crap that oh, time. Yeah. We she was going through the that. taxi and everything. We would have had a moment. Uh, there would have been a different moment. There would have been, everything would have been exposed. She might as well have been naked at that point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't kick in that. We're moving on to what's the. Uh, so and also so to start about her to bring about her next costume within that. One of the things I don't know if a lot of people noticed is Jean-Paul had an orange theme through the movie, throughout the, movie, throughout the whole movie. There's different aspects of different characters that carry that orange color yeah. throughout it, and he did that on purpose. It was a, a way to tie the vibrancy and the connectivity of the characters, right. which I thought was a really like visually brilliant way to go about that theme. You had uh, her hair being the orange, her suspenders being orange, you had Bruce Willis's character, his tank top, being orange. Um, there's just, and if you if you go and you look through it, there's going to be these little pops of this orange theory throughout, which is a fun little game to play when you're having to rewatch a movie you've seen four thousand times. So right. it's a neat little thing to get to create that aspect of it. Whenever I mean, we have some it. Tito's over here. We can just get started <laughs> right now. I know, right? Right. right. So. Really cool aspects of how he brought it about in his theories, his knowledge, and his vision in, within this movie. Right. Um, if you'll notice that one of the themes you'll see about, as you can tell, this is really a Jean Paul uh, Gaultier thing, is with Bruce Willis's uh, tank top, he started for men, he would do those cutouts. Mm -hmm. So that's something that Jean Paul did in his collections. For you know, for his, for his regular for his, fashion design, right? his actual fashion design. Mm -hmm. So he applied that that theme and that uh, aesthetic to the movie's fashion design as well, which right. is really cool when you start looking at where he brought in his consistent themes that he did throughout each of his collections into this. He didn't have to stay within that. He didn't have to bring it in, but it was sort of a signature, and I liked that he did it. And um, I gotta say, more men should really need to be wearing cutout shirts. It looked really good. Like, it's a nice aesthetic. I'm securing my masculinity to Where's get that. Wear some cutout shirts. Get your crop top, cut out that top, like, do it. Bring out those I mean, crop tops. 
football players were trying to bring it back. I mean, I will say, the men are bringing the crop tops back. They're pulling it out. So I say more power to them. <laughs> they need to be showing the maps. They, they worked for them. Let them do I it. I mean, you know, the 90s, I know. Of the basketball shirts. I know. Were, I, know. I know. I know. Bring back the legs, everything. <laughs> bring it back. I know. Wait, oh my gosh, be careful about those windbreaker shorts. Though. I don't know if I can handle that with every guy. Some of those guys need to wear underwear and meet it. Good bits. Uh, yeah, Corbin Dallas, he says here that everyone uh, layered and complex uh, feel in his, his costume reflecting the character's multi, uh, multi-factor personality and his and background. Did you, and then you notice with that, his background, she, they brought in for him to have whenever he was going to uh, the cruise, when he won his prize, you know, yeah. for his mission, they brought out the bomber-esque jacket for him to put on, which is like that military nod because he had the military background. Right. And I loved that he, John Paul even went to a more traditional route with his military costumes, like when they were showing um, them coming to get Corbin to try to convince him to do the mission, and they're all in their uniforms and the way that he, what aspects he picked about the military uniform and where he exaggerated that. And right. yet, even though they're brown, they're not a typical brown, like he still somehow made brown vibrant. Yeah. And I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? Like, yeah, the blend of the traditional yes, to, 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 his, to, to his look. To, to extraordinary was, so was a good mix. Yes, it was a really cool concept of him really bringing about his vibrancy and his aesthetic to even the traditional aspects of what he was trying to visually give you. Right. And I loved that. Um, you had your, my favorite. So this year for our Kamapalooza dress up, because we dress up on Saturdays, is, you know, you got your ruby right over there, but I am not dressing up as Lilo this year. We're not doing the bandages. I know. I'm, I did it two years in a row. I'm out. Uh, I want to be able to eat and breathe. Uh, but I'm doing a background character because I think one of the great things about this fifth element is the background characters. There are several costumes within this movie of background characters that are phenomenal. And one of the ones I'm doing is Baby Ray. Yeah. And if y'all don't know who Baby Ray is, Baby Ray is the guy who is deaf who's wearing the powder wig and the lace top with the skirt and Ruby Rod's like talking about him. He's got all these ladies around him. And he's like, and do your life. Uh, to, uh, to the left, we have some ministers, uh, ministers who's not who's more sinister than ministers. To the right, we have Baby Ray star of stage and screen. Uh, he's not gonna get much out of this concept because he's starved death. Yes, he was deaf. <laughs> and so he has a great scene with Bruce Willis where you know Bruce is screaming to him about getting a gun and he can't hear him. He's like, get the gun. He's pointing at the gun. He's like, the gun, the gun. And then uh, Baby Ray's like, oh, I got it. And then he goes and grabs two pool table balls and rolls in the pool, pool table balls instead of the gun. Best, best response. Let's talk, let's talk about that costume that, so that he was wearing a He was bit, wearing the was... very a see-through lace top, yeah. a powder wig. Again, male uh, character and a sort of like a tool skirt-esque right. thing with uh, boots, mind you. You know, they're mixing, they're doing those mixing of feminine and masculine aspects. I mean, we're in a future world where everything's just, just, just like, it's very unisex. Yes, and, it's very fluid, it's as very, I like, fluid, yeah, very yeah. fluid, as I like to call it. Yeah. And so, really blending those two sort of aspects and creating this sort of neat concept of what a masculine, again, a man surrounded by women who is in a feminine not, clothes. Not doing bad with the ladies yeah, at not, all. Yeah. Even being deaf. I mean, granted, that probably works in his favor, but... Yeah. From by most men's opinions. So, um, but yeah, it's it's these background characters. They had real thought put into what right. what their costumes would be. My absolute favorite, which I think I'm going to do next year as a another background character nod, was the McDonald's employees. Oh. The McDonald's employees are literally in these tight, like mini dresses that are red, and they have the M gold arches around the boots. With very, these very superhero, very superhero type of esque. Costume. Yes, yeah. very vibrant, very like it's a very detailed background character costume. Yeah. And Jean Paul really put in hours and hours of work. Yeah, you're right about each, even the background characters made me want to know more, more about, about those. those yes, yeah. I told you based so on, much. Just based on the look. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, at that point, I was like, well, damn, those are some fancy ass McDonald's employees. Yeah. Like, and these, like, my feet would be hurting. Like, that's literally what I'm thinking. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so their background characters, even how they did the police uniforms, you know, taking this futuristic concept and not making it doom and gloom and almost making it this cheesy, campy idea, but it never felt 
felt ridiculous, right. weirdly enough. It seemed to really work for everything that was going on in the movie, and I loved that it never felt ridiculous. The one costume that I did not like that you mentioned was the police uniforms. Oh, I thought they were, they were not functional. I mean, who, who are these guys going to arrest? Okay, so I think they... You can't chase me. I think that was the point. I think the point was to make them comical. Mm. The point was to visually create a sense of hilarity because these guys were... Were, really not able to do their job. I mean, they're getting the, the all the scenes of them are them at McDonald's or when they're chasing someone, they're in the car and they're just on the side. And your typical and just, uh, Star yeah. Wars fashion, we're shooting. Yes, no one's, no one's, getting, no one's getting hit. They're not good shots. Um, you've got the only way that they really like apprehend someone is they barely move. They do no work. Yeah. And so the puffiness, the largeness, the the cartoonish aspect of those costumes, I think, played into what they were trying to create for the police officers. Right. I think that was the idea, in my opinion. Granted. I didn't think about it like that. They, they were very stormtrooper-ish. Yes, it was comical. Yeah, it was yeah, comical. They can't see anything no, in those helmets. Come on. That was Come not on. a practical, practical right. police officer uniform for that movie at all. I'll give them that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, Redeemed. Yes. Redeemed. I, I think like that it. it was purposeful in my mind. Okay. So, well, we, we've already talked about Ruby Rock, so we, hit I mean, the, we can get, we can get, get to the get, man. Let's get to the man himself. To, to Zorg. Oh, we got Zorg right there. Perfect example of what Mr. Zerg was happening over there. You've got your businessman. I will not push the red button. No, <laughs> not happening. He might. He's actually a guy that would push the button just to see what I've happens. already pushed it. Yeah, yeah. See? I knew it. I knew it. Um, these concepts of a businessman and what that entailed and how that, what the fashion entailed for a businessman in that time, I think was a really interesting interpretation as well. Um, he really pulled in this, because you got to realize this was in the 90s. So what fashion was in the 90s? Business, like large, like the, the visual striped suit the was pinch, actually, yeah, the pinstripe pattern pin was, a, sophistication. It was a real trending thing at that time. Yeah. And it wasn't like the thin lines. We're talking to like the thick pin, like you were, like zoot suits were right. even a thing in the 90s. Yeah. So it really made sense for them to kind of bring that aspect to what was the considered the businessman or the bad guy um, that you're making. You got a luxurious look to Yes, that. you got, you got the, the material they the used. And then creating even like, for example, the way that they he, they did the hair, mm -hmm. where he's got the plastic aspect to what is a hat or a, a headpiece or a hair piece of the time, mm -hmm. what his hair is coming out of, and so purposefully what that's doing because to this day, I mean, think about all the crap we wear. I mean, I I have a hat collection, so it. it just think about how that would translate and transition to the future and what we would utilize it for. I'm, I'm kind of nervous uh, with this segment because I feel like if, if we don't give uh, his costume uh, a glowing review, that we're definitely going to feel the wrath. I know, right, because he's, he's not kind. He's well, not kind. I, for one, yeah. love the Zorg Co uh, Corporation <laughs> and, and endorse their products. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. 100%. Talk about Media is officially, unofficially sponsored by Zorg. So, <laughs> bow down to a corporation that's greater than you. Okay. I say Gary Oldman yes, was yes. Uh, fabulous. The, the Gary one. Oldman was fabulous. Oh yes, he really. I mean, he played that role so well. Like, right. I mean, so well. You despised him in that movie, but was curious about him. Like, what is he really about? Like, you wanted to know more about his character. Um, he, was, he was a showman. He I really was. Really, every scene he stole. I know. It really was. Movie. And the the way that they set up this character in the sense of how he interact with the aliens and getting them to do the work and eventually blowing them up and all the ways that he stayed on top really showed that that corporate ingenuity of how we kind of look at businessmen and how they solve the problems which <laughs> like I thought was really played out work. well you know it really played out well in my mind but uh, yeah I mean think about okay so we're talking about Zor his, his uh, assistant who is literally changing her nail color with a device that she just sticks her finger in and the nail color's changed and right. done. Like, the way that they took the details of this movie down to how they did makeup, you had Lilu's makeup with Chanel makeup. Eyeshadow, eyeshadow, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you had all these ways that they took our day-to-day -day, um, costume and wares and futurized, that's not a word, I made that up. No, uh, but, we're gonna, but we're gonna go with it. Yeah. They futurized it. Oh, well. Yeah, and uh, really brought in the concept of what could possibly be done in that time yeah. and how would that apply to fashion yeah. because makeup nails that's part of yeah, fashion boost, yeah. that, that, everything in, in basic fashion they boosted they it, boosted to, they it. it and level. they took it to and it was to the detail mm -hmm. to the 
detail. I mean, bringing about Chanel as the makeup, I mean, come on, that was brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. Giving giving that that nod to fashion in that way and, and carrying it forward was really well done. You had a lot of little things throughout the fashion, I think, that took the cake with regards to the details. Big one for me was the makeup. For me. For me, uh, was the makeup. Um, I think another aspect to it that I think, it's not, and it's hard because it's not truly fashion based, but it's like technologically based. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you got to Corbin in his hotel and the way that things interacted and how he did his daily activities, which would affect how you get dressed, how you get ready, down to his shower and how that cleaned us, down to his bed and how it got made. They really took the details of that, that futuristic aspect and applied it to the day to day activities which I think really helped boost that fashion part and the costuming part to where we would think costuming would go in the future. So I thought it was an interesting aspect of that. I like um, the fact that the note, uh, my, my overall the note uh, here said, overall, uh, the Zorix pin, uh, pinstripe suit costume from the Fifth Element movie are a standout example of expert costume design of quality and craftsmanship. There you, you really go. had to get there. that in there. You got it right I don't want him to push the button on me. Man. I know, he's looking at you. <laughs> I, I have my back to him, so I'm not feeling the pressure. So Zorg's not bothering me. But I can definitely see you sweating over there. You gotta make sure you put in those good words. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I think was interesting that you don't really think of as a costume because it's not clothing, but it really is a costume. It's cosplay, so to speak, yeah. is um, the diva. The, the diva's the entire being. The, and the pal I'm, I'm not saying it right, the pal the play ball laguna. Yeah, I'm not gonna try. I can't I'll never I'm just not say gonna, it right. I'm not gonna try. <laughs> I could listen the to the, yeah, the diva. We just called her the diva. I could listen to the movie 17 times and still not say it right, honestly. But her head to toe, like the Amazonian aspect that they kind of gave her, this incredibly tall, Ele elegant, elegant, and 100% and the inspiration uh, to the what's the water base? The uh, the aliens with uh, Avatar. Avatar. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Avatar would not be here if it wasn't for the, the diva. You think? 100%. Okay, James, okay. James Cameron did you, did will you, confirm. Oh, okay. talked you talked to him the other day? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. As long as you got that word in. I got him on speed up. Okay. okay, you let me know what he says. Yeah. I'm curious. I want the details. Um, yeah, no, it's it's really interesting how they they really captured the, in my mind, almost... I just, I always felt like it was this Amazonian, Amazon, oh my gosh, Amazonian, Amazonian uh, vibe to her. She was very strong, but yet soft and, and comforting, and that she was powerful, yet needed protection right. because she, you know, didn't have the agility. Like, there was all these aspects, and she was trusted and, and honored and within the movie. And so, you had this costume that had to display all that. And I thought they gave her the grandeur that she deserved. Right. I really thought that they did that well. They somehow made what, in my mind, looks like a silicone plastic aspect of a costume graceful. Mm. Yeah, it's not an easy costume to uh, go around in. It's interesting that you say Amazonian. I, I would have gone Atlantean, like. Because well, I'm, because I guess I'm on my water stuff. You're right? thinking of water think because to you, you're getting a water vibe. Yeah, I'm, I'm going off of presence, the, the height. I mean, the, the way she flows. The way she, even, well, yes, it's very graceful, but water can be graceful, but Amazons are graceful, too. I can't too. imagine the time it took to get into costume. Oh, my gosh, the costume, that. Um, that had to be hours upon hours of makeup oh, yeah. and hair. Oh, yeah. Yo, I can only imagine. <laughs> they have to have things like, I, you hear celebrities all the time and actors and they they talk about having to sit in the chair forever to do all the makeup and to do all the costumes and that to me has got to be a pretty hard part of those kinds of jobs because oh, yeah. then you got to prep to act but you've also got to prep to literally be in a chair for six hours and Very then bad. be in that makeup for another six hours at a minimum because you know they're not working like partial days so it, the whole concept is that it's hard work. They make the money they make for a reason sort of thing so that we can be entertained. There was a lot of uh, cosplay of that character or a, a lot of reenactments of that scene and uh, throughout pop culture after that movie uh, came out. But all the things that you hear about how it was critically uh, panned, that scene was redone, a, in my, uh, from what I remember, a, can you a give lot me of an people. Example of what you I mean, mean? Well, I, I mean, I saw it uh, maybe on spoofs and things like yeah. that. It was spoofed a lot. And, uh, well, it's, I think it was spoofed a lot because it is a cult classic. I mean, I mean, but I mean specifically the diva scene. The diva scene, scene yeah. yeah. 
I think um, the other day I weirdly enough came across a um, burlesque show where they the girl dressed up as the diva for her burlesque show. This was, granted, it was TikTok. We're not going to lie about where I saw it. It was definitely TikTok. Um, but she was a burlesque show and she had dressed up as the diva. I was like, okay, that's actually pretty good. She sang it. I mean, I said she wasn't just playing music. She was doing burlesque, singing the opera. It I see a really, lot of people on TikTok doing the singing. Yeah, they're not dressed up. But well, and singing. y'all know the actor that She's played the diva. Fresh. Well, the actor that played Chris the diva uh, was it May, May when the was, yeah she wasn't it. the original actor for it. I heard the original actor never showed up. That's the director at the time's fiance. No, that was Luke Besson's fiance. She was a pull in because that actor didn't show up to do that role. Rigged. And they, I couldn't find anywhere who the actor was. The, original? the name of the actor of the original who was supposed to do it that didn't show. I think because she didn't show, right. they, didn't, gonna... they didn't release the name. But um, yeah, I thought that was an interesting tidbit that it was just randomly Luke's fiance. I mean, I, mean, I have theories, but you know, we're, we won't go there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Whatever your theories are, <laughs> but, but, but either way it goes, it, it worked out. I mean, yes. I mean, I know it's a costume that's that's covered mostly with makeup. You can't really yeah. see uh, basically anybody probably could have played the role, but. Hey, I feel like everything in the world that's meant to happen eventually does. Yeah, yeah. She was meant to play that role. And did you know the lady who actually sung that song for the movie redid it? Like she actually did a TikTok about it and to where because people say, well, you can't actually hit those notes that that was synthesized. It was synthesized, but she could still hit those yes. notes. She's still able to go down and up the right. way that she did. It's just not easy and takes lots of training. Yeah. But they did synthesize it to give it that techno techno feel yeah. as she went into that song, but. Uh, definitely played a role of, uh, I think, how they displayed that. The the next costume that we're going to talk about was from the was the the, the manga. Or was it the, what's those aliens called? The Mangalores or Man, yeah. the Mangalores? Yeah. Atnot. Yeah. Which is the costume that I'm thinking about? Yeah, you're talking about doing it. Yeah. That's the costume that we I'm were gonna, hoping you so would do. So it this year. Turns, I'm, I will. He'll be yeah. He'll be the the on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about uh, getting ripped off by Zord next year with the uh, yep. with the purchase of these of these uh, weapons. But the one thing that I loved about the Mangalore was the, the one of the actors that, that played I can't remember his name but I loved him when he was in his human form oh yes yes uh, absolutely so I'm wondering like if I should up, if yeah. I should you know day one yes. be in my rest my normal bald headed punchable face self yes. with the Mangalore I think it would look great for the aliens yeah. punchable <laughs> it's perfect and then the, on Saturday or Sunday then wear the uh, the actual uh, mask but a little bit about what did you think about the that, that was a simple uh, to me a, 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 not that not, much of a complex uh, costume. It was, well, it I was think darker. It was that was where your sort of your dark doom and gloom came in mm -hmm. for your sci-fi fantasy that tends to be the way that people go. Yeah. So they still tied that in, but even within that, they still did exaggerated concepts. Yeah. When you look at what he's wearing, everything was still very exaggerated, very um, like overdone down to the things that were hanging from him the color that he had of the uniform mm -hmm. where it was a wider color it's not like it's like right around his neck everything kind of set here and so and that was to honestly give the perception of him going from his alien head to his human head whenever they were transitioning back and forth and so i think that the even with them doing that it still was an exaggerated piece which was sort of that theme the and theme. concept yeah. throughout all his costumes which I found fascinating. It really played to that and didn't minimalize it and didn't make it, like one of the jokes that I heard that they were doing comparisons to is like when you look at Star Wars and you look at some of the costumes in there, like for the newer movies, the guy looks like he's wearing jeans you could get at Target. Right. You know, when you look at a fantasy and you look at a sci-fi, it's futuristic. You want it to be something that's not of a concept that you can get now. You want it to be different. You want it to be unique. You want it to be this thing that is almost unattainable that you have to make. And I think that that's really what Jean-Paul did for this movie that even though at the time it wasn't critically acclaimed, that we're able to still enjoy that movie and look at because of the exaggerated nature of right. those costumes. Oh, boy, I, I don't think time. you get that these days. The no. couture that yes. because we focus, they focus more on special effects. Correct, uh, correct. All of the... Uh, I like... I mean, I think we should really honestly be bringing couture back into movies more often. Like, it, that's the purpose of couture. Couture is walking art. And when you mix walking art with visual art, 
in the aspects of your movie, I, it was your perfect blend in my mind. It makes sense. It's logical. Exactly. It's very logical. So I love that. Um, what was your next question you wanted to discuss? The, oh, well, we're uh-huh. here. We're, uh-huh. uh, I was waiting for it. My, uh, my wife, who obviously uh, gets got uh, hit on by some YouTuber because of the <laughs> she VIP was, stories. She was costume. looking good yesterday, y'all. She wore that outfit yesterday for Fox. And we'll yes. not be wearing it again tomorrow at all. Yes. Oh, yeah, she will. <laughs> but she the will. VIP stewardess, uh, Zone yes. 2 and Zone 1 stewardess, uh, yes. to be specific. But the uh, the flight attendant outfit. Flight attendant outfit, stewardess outfit. And they um, were two different colors. There were some with like a darker. It was a darker level blue and some with that lighter blue. Right. Um, same basic mini skirts, you know, it was very the sexualized. Yeah. Cutouts. But in the cutouts, yeah. because that's, that's Jean Paul's. You very know, aerodynamic. Day. I mean, they were stored. They were stored. Very I cannot with you. Cannot. What? Gosh. Um, and their hat. You had it right here in the notes. Yeah. Uh huh. Who tapped that part out? With the okay. wing. With the. With the, the little wing. wing. Yeah. So they, exactly. Uh huh. Uh huh. Very yeah. flush. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love that they gave them the boots with the chunky heels for practicality. There's like little details like that that they did that was a practicality aspect that I loved. Um, they don't have matching hair. They did, were all blonde. Oh, they did. They oh, did all have the blonde wig. I mean, that was actually one of those interesting things because they played on different races, but they all had, had the same, same, right? same hair, yeah. and they all and those I, wigs. And I went through and noticed their makeup for them was extremely simple. For they most had, of it, They had it was. blue, yeah. and that was it. And I think that's because you had such exaggerated costumes. Like, they didn't even appear, I mean, I'm sure for camera they were, but the color of their lips was almost matching their skin. Like yeah. it wasn't more natural aspects yes. of it all. Yeah. Hot tech and luxurious is what is what I would. <laughs> yeah, I'm well. Very, you would. very rare. Yeah, you would. You would for sure. Actually I have a picture of it right here. But yes, there was the lighter blue and the darker blue. All mini skirts, different cutout aspects. They placed the cutouts in different spots just like he would do with his uh the tour lines and so it was definitely a nod to that. Um, did you know to go jump back because this reminded me of it to jump back to uh, Corbin Dallas, Bruce Willis's character? Did you know that his tank top was a nod to his Die Hard costume? I assume. Yeah. I, I assume they were going for. That's for what. That. It, yeah. That's yeah, what very, that was. Because because Corbin Dallas did feel very John. Uh, yeah. John McClane is that was that? Yeah. Like, uh, whatever. Yeah. Name? And uh, I watched Dallas. that Christmas movie. Yeah. <laughs> Die Hard is not okay. We're not going to do that. We're not doing that. The fifth element is more of a Christmas movie than that. <laughs> You're gonna get him on a tangent. <laughs> we're gonna, we're, we're by heart. It's, okay, but no, the 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 I always only remember those two actresses uh, because there were uh, those two scenes with Ruby Rod. But there was there was about what six six different yeah there was stories, yeah right? because they were in different scenes throughout with regards Some to had no speaking role, right? yeah no. um, wasn't one of them didn't they have one of them next to the lady who was giving out the lays whenever they were coming on the cruise right, ship right. things like that things so they like that. they kind of placed them and again that's that that background character detail that they really played to uh, in the movie so again they did a really good job uh, can't complain about that. So one of the things that I do um, want to make sure that we note before is I really have to give Jean-Paul credit for his ability to, and I said it in the beginning, but I want to say it again, to, to really bring about his need to show what fluidity would look like mainstream throughout his concepts. He really gender bends in a lot of ways and he did that within his collections as well when you look at his collections he would make skirts for men that look like skirts but they were actually trousers right things like that or he would make uh, a long skirt that went with a very masculine top he would always do these gender bending things i like when you say that did you make that up gender bending is that uh, no that's a term okay. gender bending is a term <laughs> i'm, 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 I like that. I like, I like I'm that not that brilliant i did not come <laughs> up with all these um no he really did bring about something in pop culture that made it a normalcy to see, and right. I just really love that. When you look at this movie from that kind of lens, and you look at what he gave pop culture at that time, and helped in a community that didn't have that to see, very much, the very fa- much. The loved fashion of this of this film is like fine wine. The older it gets, it's, the yeah, better it gets. I know, and it's cheesy. Like I love. Like I even made my kids watch it. They. They have seen the fifth element. Because you're a great mother. 
We gotta get more kids to watch. I know, I know. They're our kids, up. our kids loved it. They, well, they loved Ruby Rock, of course. Yeah, uh -huh, because you're running around doing your lines. I'm like, pay attention now, Ruby Rock. Remember that name? Oh my God, it's the show's about you. We know. It's all about the whole thing. We know, we know. So, yeah, it's just it's one of those things that I think that it does hold up well in a lot of ways through time. And there are, of course, going to be things that were like, ooh, that was a little rough to watch, but, but we got to remember when it was made, what it was presenting, uh, what it was having to deal with, with within what was allowed in the culture back then. And I think it was just one of those movies that did a really good job of kind of opening your eyes to some things and seeing, push um, an yes. pushing that envelope and really creating a new look of what futuristic could be mm -hmm. and how it could be fun and bright and vibrant and not doom and gloom. Oh, oh, oh. Or green? Or green. Oh, yeah. Super green. Super green. Super green. <laughs> yes. You and your super green. Oh, gosh. What are, you got any other notes? You need to do your finals. I mean, with that, no, that, that'll that do it. That's that's the end of, uh, of the whole show here, guys. Uh, remember, we're going to be, I'm going to be giving away more uh, flyers and, and giving you the instructions for this contest that we're going to be uh, doing. So, if you... If you follow us on social media, follow us on our YouTube channel at T3 Media Studios. You, uh, you comment on any of our videos, on any of our socials with the hashtag, I think it's CP, hashtag CP, T3 Medias. You will be automatically entered for a chance to win the 4K Ultra Blu-ray version of The Fifth Element. Very rare, very rare. Uh, so we're, we're going to do a, a drawing of that uh, later this weekend. Uh, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll give away more flyers of the instructions and everything. The QR code, I, will, I should have the QR code up. Yeah, you, well, it's okay. Uh, no, we'll, we'll do it later. Yeah, we'll get it out. Look out for Ruby Rod later throughout the weekend. He will be giving away the instructions. Uh, well, he's out. He's around here somewhere. We'll, we'll, we'll have all that. Uh, but people want to find you online, tap the working people. Do oh, you can find me on TikTok at Let's Have Fun Zero One Two or on Instagram at Tabitha dot Jordan dot eighteen. That's me. Joy, if people want to find you online and not flirt with you because you're a married woman, to what can they do? Definitely so? flirt with her. <laughs> she deserves it. My TikTok is Viola Fagan and my Instagram is Scrub Hats and More by Joy. And guys, I'm Chris Fagan. You can find me at Chris W Fagan. I will be online monitoring all of her social medias because I'm toxic. No, I'm <laughs> and you can also find us at uh, T3 Media Studios on all the socials if you want to follow us. Like I said, we do a show about entertainment news and reviews by fans for fans. That's the show, guys. Appreciate you guys for standing around with us here at Comic Palooza. And until next time, guys. Bye. Peace. Thank you guys for watching our video i really do appreciate it remember you can support our show by becoming a member or a patron so click the subscribe button don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so you'll never miss out on when we go live or post new content let's stay connected grow this community together like subscribe comment and let's keep talking